Frank Heider is a well-known, renowned visual artist. When he started to become an artist, he thought the journey would be a straightforward progression. Over the years, he has discovered that the road has many twists and turns, numerous hills and valleys, and countless challenges. Through this series of short stories, tales, and remembrances, his hope is that these will offer some valuable insight into the life of an artist and what's involved in becoming an artist. In the end, he has come to realize that he is not a painter, or sculptor, or anything in particular. He is more simply a creative person, with great passion and love for the process of making art concerning people and the world around us, who shares his artworks with the public. Join us now as we listen to another episode of A Life in Art series. In the course of living the life as an artist, all sorts of things materialize. Um, and at a certain point, um, I was pretty comfortable because I had gallery representation in a couple of cities, and I had a teaching job in an art school, a prominent art school in Philadelphia. <clears throat> and it would seem to me that my life was pretty much established. I I could afford to buy art materials and I didn't think about, I didn't have the same worries that I had when I was younger. And uh, at the same time, I had a family and we were, uh, we were struggling as a family because I had older children who were kind of acting out and uh, which comes with uh, 17 or 18 year old children they they seem determined to uh, set their own course uh, we had at the time we had six children uh, oldest being 18 and uh, then sliding down from that uh, in scale to just a, a one and a half two year old and we were really, really struggling uh, with the family dynamic because the older kids were, you know, getting introduced to the police uh, with some frequency, uh, nothing serious, but they would manage to get themselves in trouble. And, uh, and of course, we're, when, you're, when you're dealing with a big family, you're dealing with small children at the same time. My wife was really involved with them much more than involved with the older ones. And in the middle, we had a son who was about 13 who had developed uh, what I clearly could see was what, what I would be call uh, a, a, a compulsive, uh, obsessive compulsive uh, disorder. He was washing his hands all the time. He, and, and he would sit in only certain chairs. He would only go through certain doors and, uh, he wasn't really talking or complaining about it, but it was really obvious that he was struggling with something. And I brought it up to my wife and she didn't, hadn't really noticed that. Uh, and she was just struggling with the issues she was struggling with. But as a whole family, we were just really coming apart. So I, I took my son out to a drug trial uh, for treating obsessive compulsive disorder. They interviewed him and put him in the trial. Ten days into the trial, the medicine was working. He was perfectly returned to normal. And as the study came to an end, I said, well, I guess you just give us that medicine and uh, he'll be okay. And the doctor said, no, it doesn't work like that. It's a trial. Whether the medicine will ever go on the market, we don't know. Uh, but we'll give him something else because we really know what will help him. Well, the medicine they gave him was Prozac and it really didn't help him. It just sort of made him a dull <clears throat> and... He was not prospering in school. Uh, the other older ones were still uh, causing enough grief. And as I said, there was so much stress in the house. And, uh, you know, my, my, my wife was going to th counselors to try to get guidance on how to, how to help the older one and how to deal with the younger ones at the same time. Anyway, it was not really working, and uh, I had just read a book by Studs Terkel uh, called Working, and in that book, uh, Studs 
talked to a lot of people who had survived the Great Depression and how they kept repeating this theme that, you know, they scooped them up off the streets of Chicago and they took them to the forests of the Northwest uh, to plant trees and just changing their environment had really changed their point of view. And they saw that what the mess that they were in was not permanent. They could get out of it. All they had to do was sort of try something different. And somehow or another from all of that, I sort of came up with a, an idea which was, I said, you know, we need to do something drastic. We need to change things here. And I had already been for the previous 10 years <clears throat> very much involved with the idea of going to South America, going to Latin America. And so uh, I had had a friend who had gotten a Fulbright to go to Mexico a few years earlier. So I called him and asked him for information. He gave me some information. I contacted the people in Washington and I discovered that we had exactly seven days to get an application filed on uh, in time. <clears throat> I had to get language certified. I had to get an invitation from a museum or a host organization in South America. And uh, we set about trying to do that, and that became a top priority. And anyway, uh, I remember going to the 30th Street Post Office station in Philadelphia at quarter of 11 on the night of the last, the last day and getting it postmarked before midnight and sending it off to Washington. <clears throat> and then we had to just wait and see what would happen. And a couple of months later, I get a letter telling me that uh, I had past the first level, which was the American uh, committee, and then I had to go before the international committee. And uh, a few weeks later, I got another letter telling me that I had won the Fulbright and that we would be going to Venezuela. <clears throat> and so I, uh, you know, started thinking, well, who's going, who's not going? And uh, we decided that the Older two boys didn't really want to go, and so they were going to be able to stay back in Philadelphia with their grandmother. <clears throat> and the younger children, uh, we tried to introduce them a little bit to uh, some Spanish uh, language uh, tapes and videos. And, uh, and the middle boy, I went to his doctor and I told him, look, I said, I'm going to take him to South America. And, um, and she said, that would be a terrible mistake. And I said, look, um, I hear what you're saying. I believe you mean the best, but I said, we've been listening to you and others like you for the last two years and things are just not going well. And I said, I, I, I feel like we have to do something. And this is what I think we might be able to do. So anyway, she said to me as she left, she said, look, you'll regret this the rest of your life. And I said, well, I'm going to try this. If I don't try this, I'll regret that the rest of my life. So anyway, we went down to Venezuela. Um, I found a, I rented a mountain top from a famous Venezuelan artist that came with a house and a big giant studio. Uh, we found uh, a Venezuelan school. It was not a public school. It was a, not an expensive, it was a small private school, but uh, only in Spanish. And uh, I, we took the, the, the children, the, the five-year-old now, who was now five, we took the five-year-old and the six-year-old and the eight-year-old to the school and dropped them off and uh, wished them well. And they went into the building and we see what would happen. I took the older boy to the school, which would be where he would go for high school. And the woman explained to me, she said, look, he doesn't speak Spanish. So we have a literature program and we have a math and science program. We're going to put him in math and science. Well, math and science were not his strong subjects. And even though since a small child, he always said he wanted to be a doctor, um, I really didn't think it was realistic because math and science are required and that was not his strong subject. So anyway, I said, well, let's see what happens. So he went to school in the math and science program. The others went to the other school. And one each day, we lived one day at a time. Um, and uh, every night we'd get together, we'd have a, a meal together and we'd hear about everybody's day and 
they were kids the small ones were learning really quickly and they were making friends they were learning spanish they were really functioning they were seemingly happy and uh my middle boy was uh he was not suffering. He was dealing with it the best he could. And uh, and eventually uh, he, he said that he thought maybe he would like to try and wean himself off the medicines, all the Prozac that he was taking. And, uh, you know, we said, well, it's up to you. See what how it goes. So he began to wean himself from the medicine. And as the year went on, um, he had friends. The other kids were doing well. And... Uh, uh, Helen, my, my wife and I were working together in the studio for the first time in our entire 30 years together. And uh, she was there because of boredom, but there was lots that she could do helping me prepare pay, things to be paint on, uh, getting uh, organized things, getting things lined up, getting uh, everything set up. And so we went, we would spend the day working in the studio and then uh, we would, every night the kids would come home, we'd have dinner together, we'd talk about the day. And I could see that things were really building and getting better. By, it wasn't an easy life. Uh, the mountain, uh, frequently we had no electricity. Uh, the phone service was very, very unreliable. Internet service was uh, oftentimes non-existent. Um, the, the water was uh, controlled by a pump that frequently broke down. Uh, so, plus there, uh, we were living literally in a jungle. So uh, there were snakes and there were scorpions and tarantulas and other kinds of things that we were not used to at all. Uh, and you, you just learn to adjust and adapt to all that. So anyway, at the end of eight months, my son, the middle boy, uh, it was the, the school year was over and I sent him back to Philadelphia so he could start the fall session in, in Philly. And um, I started getting his grades from, uh, from his high school in the United States. And he, I expected he would be getting A's in Spanish, which he was, but he was also getting A's in math and science. And uh, as he finished his high school career, he got accepted at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, majoring in, in biological sciences. When he graduated from that school, he was the top science student in the school uh, and got a job working in a laboratory doing some uh, scientific experiments in Georgetown and then a job at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School working on a science project for three years and then applied to medical schools and got accepted at 11 medical schools. Uh, ultimately, he became a Harvard graduate in emergency medicine and is practicing as a physician in Boston today. Um, his other siblings, the younger ones, uh, all still have deep connections to that year that they spent, a year and a half living in, in the rainforest of South America, connections by language and all other kinds of uh, associations with that, that experience. And uh, uh, my studio work and my wife and I work together now and continually, so this has been more than 20 years, which we had never done before. Uh, and I can say that um, uh, sometimes uh, the answer lies much closer than you might think. And it's not always in a book. It's not always in somebody's uh, uh, medicine, but rather sometimes it's just in putting yourself in a situation that forces you to use different muscles or think in new ways. And uh, for as long as I live, I will never regret having made that decision to apply for that uh, Fulbright. And the power of that year abroad, the effect it's had on my work and where my work has led. Uh, and lastly, the impact that it's had on numerous people who have been helped because my son became uh, a physician, which he would never have done if we had stayed in the United States, that I'm certain of. Uh, my other one of my daughters is a counselor, a sociologist, and a counselor, and uh, she works with uh, people who have emotional needs. Um, 
And so I think a lot of that was connected to that year that we spent searching for answers to our problems because we were so frustrated by a system that offered us lots of lots of ideas but really very few solutions so anyway um for as long as i live i'm certain that that experience of taking a little initiative and 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 stepping out and trying to put something together where the path is not clear but it helps to pull you together as a group and you find the strength between one another and build on that. Thank you for listening. If you have questions or suggestions for future episodes, please reach out to Frank Heider on Facebook or Instagram. We hope to see you at one of the next A Life in Art episodes.